searching for Sierra. On March 16, 2012, 15-year-old Sierra LaMare left her home in Morgan Hill, a community of around 50,000 people in Santa Clara County on the outskirts of San Jose, California. According to her mother, she was walking to a nearby bus stop on her way to Ann Zabrata High School, but never arrived to the location. When Sierra's mother learned of her absence from the school's automated attendance system, she immediately called the police. At first, her disappearance was treated as a simple missing persons case. While Sierra herself remained unaccounted for, police quickly began finding traces of her belongings. She went missing on a Friday morning, and by Saturday, investigators located her cell phone and found a juicy brand purse belonging to Sierra, stuffed with a pair of jeans, a shirt, a bra, and a pair of underwear, all of which were all neatly folded. The items were found about three quarters of a mile from Sierra's home, where the teen lived with her mother Marlene and mother's boyfriend Rick. Despite this, authorities were still not sure whether Sierra had run away from home or if there was something more sinister afoot. The Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office determined that Sierra's discovered clothing bore traces of someone else's DNA. This trail led investigators to Antolin Garcia Torres. At the time of Sierra's disappearance, he had been just weeks shy of his 21st birthday. The morning she went missing, security footage showed him leaving his home about 15 minutes before Sierra's disappearance to supposedly go fishing. Garcia Torres lived in a trailer with his mother and then pregnant girlfriend about seven miles from Sierra's house. But despite his past and his DNA on Sierra's clothing, Garcia Torres pled not guilty in February of 2014. In May of 2014, Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rosen announced that he would be seeking the death penalty for Garcia Torres. But that came with consequences. There had been instances in the past like the J.C. Duggard and Elizabeth Smart kidnapping cases of victims who were presumed to be dead but were later found alive. The defensive party in this trial was going to cling on to the reasonable doubt theory and claim that the DA's office was not willing to give a fair trial, regardless of how incriminating the circumstances were. A showdown is brewing in the Sierra Lamar murder trial. The defense claims the 15-year-old could still be alive. They say that they have a piece of evidence that actually supports that claim. Action News reporter Lauren Sieber has been following the case. She's here now with more. Dan Arian, it's the piece of evidence that could drastically change the trial. A note the defense says was written by Sierra Lamar. The defense wants to introduce that note found in Sierra Lamar's notebook indicating the teenager planned to run away on the date she disappeared. The note written in Spanish says, quote, I hate my life and I will be in San Francisco by 31612. Sierra Lamar disappeared on her way to school on March 16th, 2012. Her body has never been found. Antolin Garcia Torres was arrested for her murder, and now four years later, jury selection has started. The prosecution believes there is no proof the note was written by Sierra. Legal anal analyst says the runaway theory doesn't explain away DNA evidence or Torres's incriminating statements to police. The trial was originally set to start on April 25, 2016, but was pushed back to January of 2017. The search for Sierra's body continued to no further avail. With no body, no crime scene, and no weapon, the prosecution relied heavily on Garcia Torres' DNA. However, the defense for Garcia Torres argued that the sloppy preservation from investigators led to cross-contamination of the evidence. And if the DNA was faulty, then the DA would have absolutely no leverage in the case. But during the testimonies of the deputies in charge of the DNA evidence, they spoke against the defense's accusations. A deputy explained how he would strategically change latex gloves each time he touched the contents of a bag that contained Sierra's belongings. During the trial's closing arguments, the defense also attempted to portray Sierra as a distraught teenager who was unhappy at home and ran away and could still be potentially alive. But the prosecution argued Sierra had no hidden life and that it was unreasonable to think that she would run away without telling any friends on social media. After a five-month jury trial and more than five years after Sierra's disappearance, the jury found Garcia Torres guilty for Sierra's kidnapping and on three additional counts of attempted kidnapping back in 2009. After the guilty conviction, the jury also had to decide if Garcia Torres should get the death penalty or spend the rest of his life in prison. Sierra's parents, her two best friends, 10th grade English teacher, and her older sister all gave statements highlighting Sierra's goofy sense of humor and playful personality. Garcia Torres' mother, Laura Torres, also gave a statement, giving more insight into Garcia Torres' family history. Her mother claimed that Garcia Torres witnessed and experienced abuse from his father starting from a very young age, which may be seen as a grounds for sympathy or as the pathological root of his criminality. 
Despite his criminal history, Torres described her son as a loving and responsible son who took on a protective role in the family after his older brother Benny was lost to drugs, jail, deportation, and eventually death. Antolin Garcia Torres was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole on June 5, 2017. For years, Antolin Garcia Torres refused to talk about his case, ignoring several requests for comment or interviews from reporters. In 2020, he finally broke his silence, replying to a handwritten letter sent by digital journalist Amy Larson. Larson asked Garcia Torres four questions in her letter, but he only replied to one. The question was, do you still maintain your innocence? He replied with, yes, Amy, I hold fast to my innocence. Garcia Torres is still serving out his sentence in prison with no attempts to overturn his conviction. It's now been over 10 years since her disappearance, and Sierra's body, murder weapon, and crime scene location have never been found. Have you seen Amy? 17-year-old Amy Billig was a high school student who lived in Coconut Grove, Florida with her parents Ned and Susan and her younger brother Josh. At around 12 p.m. on March 5, 1974, she came home from school to have lunch. She planned to go out with friends later that night and called her dad asking to borrow some money. Amy vanished while hitchhiking to his office on her way to borrow the cash. Shortly after she vanished, her camera was found at the Wildwood exit on the Florida Turnpike and was surrendered to police. Many of the photos were overexposed and the few decent ones had no further clues to her whereabouts. Investigators next interviewed Amy's friends, family, and neighbors but could find no trace of her. Twelve days later, Susan, Amy's mother, received tips that she may have been kidnapped by a motorcycle gang called the Outlaws and taken cross-country. She learned that a chapter of them had come through Coconut Grove at the time of Amy's disappearance. A family friend who had done legal work for the Outlaws arranged a meeting between Ned, Susan, and two members of the gang. Although the gang members claimed to have not seen Amy personally, they confirmed that other members had kidnapped and sold young women in the past. They promised to ask others about Amy, but they were never able to provide any further information. Three months after Amy's disappearance, Susan tracked the outlaws to Orlando, Florida, about 160 miles away from her home. The convenience store manager remembered seeing Amy being escorted by at least two bikers. The manager remembered that she always bought vegetarian vegetable soup, and this was a very important piece of information because Amy had been a committed vegetarian. Susan was almost certain that the sighting was legitimate. However, another year and a half would pass before Susan received another lead. On January 9, 1976, an outlaw member and enforcer named Paul Brandt contacted her after seeing a picture of Amy in the newspaper. He claimed that he had actually owned Amy at one point in time, and he agreed to talk to Susan but only at his house. And when shown a clearer picture of Amy, he was certain that this was the girl he had previously owned. He described her as quiet like a mute, and he also described a hidden scar on her body which Susan had never divulged publicly. This made Susan certain that the abducted girl was Amy and Paul agreed to try and contact the person he believed now had Amy. A few weeks later, Paul contacted Susan and claimed that Amy was now living in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In June 1976, Paul and Susan arrive at a tavern where Paul claimed Amy would be delivered to them. While there, a fight broke out and Susan was whisked away and placed in a cab by one of the bar patrons. She never saw Paul face to face again. Paul later contacted authorities to tell them that Amy was now in Seattle, Washington. In November 1977, Susan traveled to Seattle even though she had suffered a heart attack a few months earlier. She frequented bars, tattoo parlors, and motorcycle shops, and several people recognized photographs of Amy, describing her as always quiet and like mute. However, she once again found herself without any further leads. Eighteen months later, in the winter of 1979, an anonymous male caller told Susan that Amy was at a remote truck stop outside of Reno, Nevada, and that she desperately needed help. FBI agents learned that the biker gang had now been in the area briefly, but there was no way to verify if Amy was with them. More years passed by before Susan was contacted by a private investigator named Virginia Snyder in 1992. Virginia and a British investigator were working on a different case when they received a tip about Amy. The investigator was in a post office in England when he was approached by an American biker. He said that he had a girl that he wanted to sell and was, quote, mute. The description seemed to match Amy. However, he left without showing a picture of her. Susan felt certain that the woman described was Amy. However, she was unable to find any traces of her. Sadly, that British investigator passed away a year later. In December 1997, Paul, the biker gang member who claimed to have previously owned Amy, allegedly confessed on his deathbed that he really knew what had happened to her. He claimed that she had been drugged, assaulted, and killed at a party within hours of being abducted. 
He claimed that her body was then thrown into the Florida Everglades where approximately 200,000 alligators inhabit its waters. He died before police could further question him. However, they were able to verify some details of his account. Amy's camera was found near Wildwood, which would have been on the route that outlaws took traveling north. But despite the confession, Amy's remains were never located. Initially, Amy's family believed the confession and in March of 1998, Susan held a memorial service for Amy. However, they have since come to doubt its credibility. They believe that Paul's widow, who came forward publicly with the dead bed confession of Amy's murder, may have made it up for publicity and money. She was reportedly paid for her interview for a documentary about the case, and sadly, Susan passed away on June 7, 2005 at the age of 80 years old. She had searched for Amy for over 30 years, and to this day, Amy's remains have never been found. Number three, it's just a haze. 19-year-old Brooke Baker was a journalism major and sophomore at Vincennes University in Indiana. She was ambitious and hoped to become a top flight journalist one day, but all her aspirations were cut short when tragically, on September 7, 1997, her brother found her dead in her off-campus apartment. Brooke had been assaulted and stabbed to death, and although there were no signs of forced entry, there was evidence of a violent struggle between her and her assailant. She had 11 stab wounds, multiple bruises, and evidence under her fingernails indicated that she had been violently restrained. However, several things stood out as the crime scene was examined. Oddly, the water was still running from the bathtub faucet, which was now filled with towels at the time of her body's discovery. The kitchen sink was also filled to the brim with soapy water, and a bent kitchen knife was found at the bottom of the sink. As investigators began looking into the case, they discovered three possible theories as to who would kill Brooke. The first theory involved Brooke's participation in journalism at Vincent's University. There, she became very active with the campus newspaper, and in spring of 1997, she was investigating an alleged sexual assault that occurred at a local fraternity. She interviewed several women who had run-ins with the fraternity members. However, the fraternity charter disliked her investigation into the case, and they threatened her verbally as well as with emails. Brooke was unfazed by the backlash, but her mother, Janet Baker, was concerned about Brooke's safety. Brooke responded by saying that she was writing this story to keep others from becoming potential victims. A few weeks before she was killed, she was at a friend's house when a truck full of frat brothers arrived and threatened her. In order to feel safer at school, she moved to a new off-campus apartment in which the landlord was also a campus police officer. This leads us to a second theory, which is that the landlord was potentially responsible for Brooke's death. Brooke told her friends and family that the landlord would come into her apartment unannounced at various times of the day. One night while she was sleeping, he shined a flashlight inside her her unit, and another night he came in while she was in the shower. She told multiple people that she was uncomfortable about the situation, and investigators believe that he may have let himself in on the night of her murder. A third possible theory involving Brooke's death was that the person posing as a potential roommate potentially killed her. Just days before her murder, Brooke placed an ad in the campus newspaper looking for a roommate for a new apartment. Investigators believe that her killer may have read the ad and went to Brooke's apartment claiming to be looking for a new home. This theory is supported by the fact that there was no evidence of forced entry into her apartment. Meanwhile, investigators began looking into the physical evidence they found while scouring the crime scene. They tested DNA samples found on Brooke with more than 50 suspects connected to the victim, but none of them matched. On July 5, 1999, investigators searched the apartment of another missing Vincent's college student named Erica Norman and were shocked to discover a nearly identical crime scene to Brooke's murder, including water running from the bathtub's faucet. However, Erica's body was not found in her apartment. Authorities searched Erica's home where they found blood on walls, dishes, and lamps, but no signs of forced entry or robbery. In the bathroom, water was overflowing from the tub, which contained a couch cushion from the living room, and the use of the overflowing water immediately jogged the memory of Brooke's crime scene. Detectives traced Erica's whereabouts to the hours before she vanished, and on July 3rd, the last time she was seen alive, she was with friends at a local bar. Witnesses told investigators that she had been seen with Brian Jones, a 22-year-old former Vincent student with nothing more than a traffic ticket on his record. Jones told investigators that he and Erica Norman watched a movie together and then went their separate ways. He'd agreed to give a DNA sample and allowed authorities to search his car and home and turned in clothes he had worn the night he was with Erica. That outfit included a pair of shoes, upon which an investigator noticed what looked like a blood stain. Other traces of blood were also found in Jones's car. And while awaiting lab analysis on the blood evidence, the case took another turn after 16 days of intensive seeking for Erica. In Lawrence County, Illinois, a farm worker discovered human remains in a cornfield, and dental records confirmed it was Erica Norman. Crime lab analysis also confirmed that the blood on Jones's shoes and inside his car was Erica's. His DNA also matched evidence found on Brooke's body. 
After being questioned and arrested for the Erica Norman case, Jones pleaded guilty to murdering Erica Norman, and the guilty plea in the case was part of a plea agreement that took the death penalty off the table. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison and was later convicted in Knox County Superior Court of assault and fatally stabbing Brooke Baker. On December 14, 2000, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Brooke and Erica's murders. Number 4. Bunny's Bus Stop 18-year-old Bonnie Craig was barely starting her young adult life and was a well-liked college freshman at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. At about 5 a.m. on the morning of September 28, 1994, she left early for school to arrive at her 7 a.m. class. Two days a week, Bonnie walked 45 minutes through the early morning darkness to catch the bus. She was a diligent student who prided herself on arriving promptly for her English class. However, she never arrived that morning to class and her body was found floating in the McHugh Creek shortly after her absence was noted. The medical examiner determined that she had drowned, but she had also suffered severe head injuries, possibly resulting from a fall off a cliff while hitchhiking to class. At first, Alaska State Troopers believed Bonnie had died in a random accident, but her mother Karen found evidence that she may have been murdered. When she viewed her body, Karen noticed several defensive wounds on Bonnie's hands. She did not believe that Bonnie would go to the creek that early in the morning right before her 7 a.m. class. Also, the creek was 10 miles from her bus stop location, and she had no way of getting there by car. And furthermore, the belongings that she took to school that day were not found alongside her body. According to Karen, the police kept most of the information about the case to themselves. Karen luckily found an ally in reporter Maria Downey, who was also trying to get more information about this case. For unknown reasons, police did not initially release the results of the autopsy examination. Karen was initially told that Bonnie had not been sexually assaulted but later came to find the autopsy results six months later. Unidentified bodily fluid was found during Bonnie's examination. However, police did not rule out the possibility that it came from a consensual act. Frustrated with the police working on this case, Karen began her own investigation. She suspected that Bonnie's murder might have had something to do with her previous undercover work with the local police. An informant told her that Bonnie may have been targeted by a drug lord after a sting Bonnie was involved in resulted in the arrest of several members of his organization. The informant also claimed that Bonnie's murder might have served as a message to the police department to back off. According to Karen, Bonnie was murdered the day after the people that she identified in the sting operation were released from jail. Despite the precautions taken to protect her identity during the bus, it wouldn't have been difficult for the accused to learn who had divulged their identities. And Karen was again frustrated when she met one of the lead investigators. When she told him about the information she received from the informant, he reportedly asked her for the identity of her source. However, she had promised the informant she wouldn't reveal their identity, and as a result, she believes the investigators never followed up on the lead. One year later, one of Bonnie's professors contacted Karen. She became extremely suspicious of one of her students, suspecting that he might have been involved in Bonnie's murder. The professor claimed that the student was late for school on the day of Bonnie's murder. When he came to class, he noted that he was wet, like he had just gotten out of the shower, and he also smelled like he had poured a bunch of cologne on himself. And after Bonnie's murder was announced, their writing style in class took a drastic turn in tone and mood. However, DNA evidence and an alibi ruled him out as a suspect. Now they were back to square one, and in September of 1997, authorities finally acknowledged that Bonnie had been assaulted and beaten before her death. They believe she was either thrown over the cliffs where she was located or fell while escaping her attackers. Troopers try to find a witness who may have seen the attack on the last morning Bonnie was alive. A neighbor reported seeing Bonnie walking down the street at around 5.20 a.m. and another witness saw her at the bus stop one hour later. Another neighbor saw a car idling in front of her home that morning. And finally, an anonymous caller to the police claimed to have seen her at the bus stop talking to two men in a car. Despite these sightings, they did not have any evidence to arrest anyone in the connection to the case. It wouldn't be until another nine years before the next breakthrough would happen in the case. DNA previously found on Bonnie's body was placed into the technologically updated DNA database. In November of 2006, it was matched to 36-year-old Kenneth Dion. He was in prison in New Hampshire for a series of armed robberies when the match was made. At the time of Bonnie's murder, he lived in the Anchorage area and was on probation for robbery and was released from prison just a few months earlier. In May 2007, Dion was charged with Bonnie's murder. It is believed that the crime was a random act of violence and that he picked her up while she was walking to the bus stop. At the trial in May of 2011, he claimed that he had consensual sex with her and that she accidentally failed to her death while they were alone at the creek. However, when Dion was first questioned, he initially claimed that he didn't know Bonnie. 
and he also couldn't account for his whereabouts on the day that she vanished. Dion's wife was quoted saying he was not home the entire week of Bonnie's disappearance. Furthermore, the medical examiner determined that Bonnie's injuries were caused by a blunt object or a weapon, not from a fall. And at the time, Dion carried weapons in his car, which could have inflicted the injuries. Also, a leaf with Bonnie's blood was found above the cliff's area, suggesting that she was already injured prior to the fall from the cliff. Finally, her family noted that Bonnie was in a strict, committed relationship with her boyfriend at the time and would not have had sex with someone else, especially a complete stranger. On June 15, 2011, Dion was found guilty of Bonnie's murder. And on October 31st, 2011, Dion was sentenced to 124 years in prison. Number five, the devil's playground. On the afternoon of May 18th, 1993, five-year-old Ali Bareles went out to play with her three-year-old brother in the courtyard of their apartment complex in Inglewood, Colorado. At one point in the evening, their babysitter went inside for a few minutes, and when she came back out, Ali was nowhere to be found. Police believed that she had been abducted, but had very few clues to go off of. Four days later, a bloodhound named Yogi and his handler Jerry Nichols were brought in to trace her scent and help find her. Yogi took Ali's scent from clothes she had recently worn and started the search. He first went up the stairs and zeroed in on a specific apartment, the one Ali lived in. This meant that he was on the right track. He then led Jerry out of the apartment complex and down the street heading south. Television news reporters followed closely behind and the bloodhound was able to use their saliva to help detect the scent trail better. A scent trail, whether from an animal or human, comes from thousands of dead skin cells that are constantly being shed. Despite many dead skin cells in the air from various people, a bloodhound has the ability to focus in on one specific person's scent. While they walked, Jerry noticed that Yogi was picking up the scent more sporadically. This meant to him that Ali had more than likely been taken in a car and driven along a nearby route. People leave scent trails from moving cars as skin cells shoot out through the car's ventilation and exhaust system. They are then deposited on the side of the road where bloodhounds' noses can pick them up. Yogi led the search party south for several miles, covering almost 40 city blocks. At the entrance to a freeway, he headed straight up the westbound ramp, and the search party drove west to the next exit. Yogi went past it and continued to pick up the scent down the freeway. The search party did this several times at each exit. To save some time, police decided to skip the fourth exit and move on to the fifth one. When they got to the fifth exit, Yogi lost the scent. He apparently realized that they had overshot the scent trail. They backtracked one half mile to the fourth exit. He picked up the scent again and led the search party off the freeway. He headed in the direction of the woods near Deer Creek Canyon, and after seven hours, Jerry started to realize that Yogi was being overworked. He decided to temporarily stop the search. The next morning, human volunteers continued to search in Deer Creek Canyon, and tragically, about an hour later, they discovered Allie's body. She had been stuffed into a khaki duffel bag and tossed off a 20-foot embankment. She was found less than two miles from the point where Yogi was stopped. Without Yogi, Ali's body may have never been found, and as a token of their appreciation, Ali's family has set up a foundation for bloodhounds so that they are available to search for missing people. In recent years, detective taking a new look at Ali's murder matched a DNA profile to Nick Stoffer, ending a decades-long search for her family. On February 8, 2011, several items of evidence were submitted to the investigators for updated testing. An agent developed a complete DNA profile from an area of Ali's underwear waistband, and on September 13, 2011, it was announced that the DNA profile was also matched to Nick Stoffer. Detective Bobby Garrett, who was in charge of the new investigation, found that there was a large amount of circumstantial evidence as well against Stoffer. At the time of the abduction, Stoffer lived in Ali's apartment complex. He had been there for three weeks prior to her abduction and abruptly moved to California just five days after her murder. He made reservations for his flight on the morning of May 18th, the day Allie disappeared. Detectives traveled to Redlands, California to take blood and hair samples from Stoffer. And when questioned, he claimed he was with two other tenants of the apartment complex when Allie was first discovered to be missing. He claimed that he then went to a nearby payphone and made some phone calls. However, the tenants claimed that when Stoffer left the area, Allie was still in the courtyard playing, making it more than plausible for Stoffer to run into Allie and abduct her within the allotted time frame. Furthermore, phone records prove that he did not make any phone calls that day. Two days after she vanished, he borrowed a friend's Buick claiming he needed to get his last paycheck from a previous railroad job. However, in reality, Stoffer had already been paid for the job and he was fired two months earlier. Detectives learned during the investigation that as a teenager, Stoffer frequently partied in Deer Creek Canyon, and a friend who helped Stoffer move into his apartment said he owned a military-style canvas bag, similar to the one Allie's body was found in. 
Stoffer was also a welder, and police suspiciously found metal shavings inside the duffel bag Allie's body was discovered in. On top of the mounting evidence, carpet fibers were also found on Allie's blouse, which only matched the carpet inside of Stoffer's unit. Unfortunately for Allie's family, justice was never properly served. Stoffer was found inside of his newly rented Phoenix apartment, dead of an apparent drug overdose. Police were called there on a welfare check after his family had not heard from him in some time, and when his body was discovered, he had already been dead for two days. Number six, I'll be right back. 16-year-old Carrie Lynn Nixon lived with her family in Osables Forks, New York, located in the shadows of New York's mountains with a population of 3,000 people. Osables Forks is a friendly and family-oriented community where violent crimes are extremely rare, but in 1987, Osables Forks was shocked when Carrie mysteriously disappeared after running an errand for her parents. On the evening of June 22, 1987, at approximately 9.30 p.m., Carrie left her home to run an errand for her father, Gary. She headed to Thomas's Country Store, a neighborhood market a few blocks away. After purchasing some groceries, she left the market at 9.55 p.m. and headed towards her home. As she took the familiar path along Palmer Street to her house, at 10.05 p.m., she exchanged greetings with a neighbor. At 10.10 p.m., a group of boys walked by that same route but saw no signs of Carrie. Somehow in the five minutes between 10.05 and 10.10 p.m., and just 700 feet from her home, Carrie had mysteriously disappeared. Unfortunately, Carrie's mother, Kathy, didn't realize Carrie was missing until the following morning when she went to go wake Carrie up for school. Kathy was horrified at her discovery and immediately called the authorities. The investigators began a large air and ground search in the 50-mile area surrounding Osables Forks, and many volunteers from the local fire departments and Air Force Base came to help. But despite this, no trace of Carrie had been found. According to investigators, Carrie wrote several letters to a friend, and in these letters, she indicated that she would like to live in Hawaii, Florida, or possibly California. She stated at least twice in these letters that she wanted to leave Osables Forks when she turned 18, and authorities began to speculate that Carrie might be a potential runaway. However, other investigators noted the unusual circumstances leading up to her disappearance. Carrie was dressed in sweats and her father gave her $20 for groceries. She went to the market, paid $3 for the groceries, and left the market with the bag of groceries. Authorities speculate that if she was a runaway, she would have done none of those things. They believe Carrie would have taken the money with her that she saved in her bedroom, and they found Carrie's savings when they searched her room after she went missing, which further pointed to the potential abduction. On top of that, Carrie was close to her family and they often spent quality time together and everything pointed to a happy and stable relationship with her parents. Her father believed somebody pulled up alongside her while she was walking home that night. Whether it was consensual or by force, he believes Carrie got into some type of vehicle. By the fall of 1987, the investigation had reached a dead end, but in November of that same year, New York State Police received a letter from an anonymous writer in Flint, Michigan. The letter read, look for Carrie Lynn Nixon in the Utahville, South Carolina area. Despite the anonymous nature of this lead, her family traveled to Utahville. They blanketed the small town with flyers, and the family was just as surprised as police when a local resident remembered having spoken with a 16-year-old girl who had shyly given her name as Carrie Lynn Nixon. Shirley Canapel is the Utahville resident who reported this encounter. She had seen Carrie's picture on one of the flyers posted by the Nixon family. She says that she recognized Carrie immediately because she had seen her in town just three weeks prior. Her hair and earrings were the same as in the picture, but most importantly, her name was the same as the girl that had been introduced to her. According to Utahville police, there had been numerous townspeople around the area that claimed to have also seen Carrie. Shirley was unable to remember many details of her sighting, and at the request of the New York State Police, she underwent hypnosis. The hypnotist asked her to go back to the day that she supposedly saw Carrie. Shirley recalled that it was a hot day, and a little red-headed girl came up and asked her to meet a new friend of hers, whom she identified as Carrie Lynn Nixon. Shirley asked Carrie where she was from, and the girl replied, New York. Shirley then asked her if she was down here to stay, and the girl said yes. The hypnotist next asked Shirley to describe Carrie. She said that she had long brown hair, and she asked Carrie where she was staying, but the friend answered for her, saying, across the lake. Carrie came off as shy and unwilling to offer much conversation beyond her name. Shirley then asked her to repeat her first name, and the girl repeated Carrie. Shirley had previously worked for about four and a half years in a program where some of her clients were runaways, and this allowed her to pick up some cues, such as the way Carrie evaded her questions that prompted her to believe Carrie was a runaway. After the session, authorities investigated the circumstances of Shirley's sighting. They found the girl who was allegedly with Carrie, but were disappointed to discover that she suffered from a memory lapse and could not recall the incident. I personally believe that this girl and her Carrie look-alike friend orchestrated the prank with Shirley after seeing the missing flyers around town and wanted to see if they could trick some residents into believing their ruse. 
After failing to find any other confirmed sightings of Carrie, the investigation once again reached a dead end. In the time since she vanished, police investigated 70 sightings, conducted over 1,500 interviews, and examined over 200 unidentified bodies. They still had no idea where Carrie was. The case frustrated police and devastated Carrie's family, and as the years in the investigation dragged on, Kathy and Gary began to give up hope of ever finding their daughter. But all that changed in March 1990 when family and friends saw a videotape of a concert given by the popular singing group New Kids on the Block. On June 5, 1989, the group filmed their Hanging Tough Live concert in Los Angeles, California. Among the crowd of teenage fans, there was a girl who bore many similarities to Carrie. Kathy said she was not 100% convinced, but she believed that the girl in the video looked a lot like her daughter. When investigators viewed the tape, they picked the look-alike out immediately and a detailed enhanced photograph was made from the videotape and compared with a picture of Carrie taken shortly before she disappeared. Investigators noted many similarities including hair length, hair color, face shape, chin, and mouth, and specifically, the girl had multiple earrings in her right ear. Carrie was also known to have four earrings in her right ear and two in her left. The enhanced photo further convinced Kathy and Carrie that the girl could have been Carrie. Members of New Kids on the Block did not recognize the girl in the crowd, but after hearing Carrie's story, they wanted to make a personal appeal on Unsolved Mysteries. Member Jonathan Knight asked Carrie to call the police and explain her situation to them. He also pleaded to viewers who may have seen Carrie at the New Kids on the Block show or out in public to contact the police and let them know where she is. In November 1990, investigators located the girl in the music video living in California. However, the girl in the video wasn't Carrie. Her name was Lynette Melancon. The case continued to frustrate police in Ostable's forks for nearly seven more years. Finally, in January 1994, they got the break they were hoping for when 29-year-old Robert Anthony Jones was identified as a suspect. He had been arrested for four bank robberies which were committed in northeastern New York and Maine between 1987 and 1993. In September of 1993, he pleaded guilty to robberies as well as firearm charges, and he was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison. While being questioned about the robberies, Jones's wife, Teresa, told police that Jones confessed that he killed Carrie. Shortly afterwards, she pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting one of Jones's robberies. While awaiting sentencing, she persuaded Jones into confessing the murder to police, and he agreed to do so in order to get Teresa a lighter sentencing. At the time of Carrie's disappearance, Jones was 23 years old and living in Bar Harbor, Maine with Teresa and their children. On the week that Carrie vanished, he returned to his hometown of Osables Forks for a week-long visit. He told police he spotted Carrie while he was buying beer at a neighborhood market. He followed her and forced her into his car at gunpoint. He then drove her to his parents' remote cabin in Jay, New York, about six miles from Osables Forks, where he assaulted her for several hours. He tried to strangle her but ultimately shot Carrie. He then buried her body in the woods near the cabin the following morning. He later returned to the Osables Forks area where he settled with his family shortly following the murder. The most disturbing fact about this case is that every year following the murder, Jones took his family to the area of Carrie's shallow grave for a picnic so he can inconspicuously check to see if the grave had been disturbed or discovered. On January 28, 1994, Jones led state troopers to the shallow grave where they recovered Carrie's remains. Also found in the grave were her clothing, shoes, and the groceries she had purchased the night she went missing. The grave was just a few mere miles from Carrie's home. In February 1995, Jones pleaded guilty to first-degree kidnapping, first-degree sexual assault, and second-degree murder in relation to her case. As part of his plea deal, he was given a sentence of 18 years to life, and it was to be served concurrently with a 15-year robbery sentence. Jones has been up for parole multiple times in the past six years, and in order to continue to seek justice for Carrie's death, Carrie's mother travels to Jones's parole hearings to give her testimony on how his actions have forever impacted her family. She has successfully stated her case multiple times and has ensured Jones's continued incarceration. At the time of her death, Carrie Lynn Nixon was just 16 years old.